It starts with gratitude. And gratitude nuggets on chew, nuggets to chew on. David will show us the transformative power of gratitude. He was recently featured on New Day with Marcus Larson on King, King TV and chat with women on KPI Saturday. With 30 gratitude videos posted on YouTube, over 3,000 viewers have seen his message. And he is now considered a leading authority on gratitude and how living a life of gratitude can enhance and improve your life. So I'd like to welcome Dave George Brooks. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, everybody at Bainbridge Island Rotary for having me today. Uh, I'd like to ask, first of all, how many here by show of hands have suffered a significant personal setback in your life? Thank you. Everywhere I go, I speak from 20 people, maybe up to 1,000. It's always about 80 or 90% of the room that have suffered something. And somebody mentioned to me one day, you know, it isn't just personal, it can be business, this economy, people have lost houses, jobs, careers, this type of thing. And so it occurred to me one day, how am I gonna, how am I gonna cope with these types of things that happen? So I will tell you about uh, September 29th, 1998, and it was just mentioned September 29th for the, uh, the gooey duck deal. And that was a big day for me, because that was a day, it was a Tuesday in 1998, September 29th, and I woke up, it was about six o'clock in the morning, and I looked over and my wife wasn't there. And normally she would be in bed, and I thought, that's funny, I wonder where Dana is. And uh, just then my four-year-old comes over, Connor, just about this high, and says, where's mom? I don't know. And then just then Kyle comes in, where's mom? Kyle's 14. So we go walking down the hallway in the house and we look in a couple of the rooms, we don't see her, and we look downstairs and she's face down in front of the washer and dryer. So we go running down there, I turn her over, there's stuff coming out of her mouth, something's dreadfully wrong. So Kyle runs upstairs, I said, call the police, call everybody you can, call the cops, call fire, medic, you name it. Connor's just crying nonstop, it's okay, it's okay. So I take her out in this other room, I start doing CPR, chest compressions, mouth to mouth, everything I can think of back from those Red Cross training days. And within a matter of minutes, the whole house is teeming with medical personnel. And they've got the wires and tubes and those paddles, just like you see on the medical shows on TV, and her chest is bumping up in the air. And we're all beside ourselves, we don't know what's happening. And for those of you who have ever suffered through something like this, you'll notice that time loses all measure because it seemed like just two or three minutes and this little short fire person comes over me, this, this fire person, young lady. She says, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half and we still don't have any heartbeat. Would you like us to continue? And I don't think ever in my life I'd ever been in a situation where I had to make a life and death decision for somebody else. And I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. She's 38 years old. And the other thing I learned through this, among many, many things, of course, was is how shock works. You're numb, you're shocked, you're in shock. Your body's trying to protect itself. And you don't know if you're living this or dreaming it, if it's a dream or a nightmare or whatever, but you wake up each day and then realize it's actually happening. And I remember about two or three days later, I walked upstairs and had a small deck on the back of the house, and I walked outside by myself and I looked up at the sky. And I thought, now I understand why people kill themselves. Because I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle this. I've got my two young boys, as I mentioned, 4 and 14. And what made my story somewhat more compelling, if not a lot more compelling, is I'd already lost my mother to cancer when I was young. My father, was a, he was a Rotarian also. He's a very prominent attorney in Seattle. He committed suicide. And a couple of my best friends died the night we graduated from high school in their horrible crash on Dexter up by Lake Union. And it just went on and on and on. And I remember thinking, I'm gonna have to figure out what to do. And, and several of the people already today have asked me, I do a couple of three talks a week. Well, how'd you get into this gratitude thing? Well, one of the things is I figured I'm gonna have to figure out something's gonna save me because too many people are dying. And of the 20 or 30 people that have been relatively close to me that have passed away, I'd say half of them died of their own hand. Suicide, overdoses, all this incredibly negative, deadly coping mechanisms that are out there. So I realized at that point, it, it all depends on how you look at something. And so I'd like you to all stand up for a second if you would. I think lunch is pretty much over. So all stand up if you would, and I'd like you to just stretch out your right arm 
and start turning in a clockwise direction. There is a clock over there for anybody that, uh, I know Tom is the spelling bee champion, but I'm sure he knows how to do the clockwise. So keep doing it clockwise, feel the nice stretch. Now as you bring it down, just start bringing it down slowly. Keep it going clockwise, about to your eyes, your chin, your chest. Now keep it at your waist. Now what direction is it going? It's going counterclockwise. Thank you, you can sit down. The phone even said counterclockwise, I heard it right there. I've actually had people that come up to me, how do you do that trick with the counterclockwise thing? I say, it, these are intelligent people. Larry has mentioned PhDs for children. I mean, these, this one was a PhD. I said, it's just how you look at it. It's just my illustration of how you look at it. But what it comes down to is you have to decide how you're going to look at things. There's all these coping mechanisms that are out there that, again, are just so deadly. About six months prior to Dana's death, she had been addicted to painkillers. Oxycontin and Vicodin, two words I don't really like to say much. Dr. Dickinson is at this treatment center in Everett and he says, come on in, I want to talk to you. Are you David Brooke? Are you Dana's husband? I said, yeah, I need to let you know what you're up against. He points out to the room, again, I'll guarantee you, any size room, people always know this. because They always come up and talk to me about it afterwards. I went through something like this, I experienced that. And he points out to him, he says, see him? He's a doctor, she's a lawyer, he's a PhD, and they try to make you feel better because it affects everybody. But I said, frankly, the only person I'm concerned with is the blonde gal right there. That's Dana, that's my wife. And he goes, no, I know. But I want to let you know what you're up against. He said, I've been doing this for 30 years. One in 20 will make it back to a normal life. That's it, one. And of the 19 that don't, half of them will be dead in the next year. And she was gone about six months later. Still didn't believe it to this day. It's just, it's just still so much of a disbelief type of thing. So I realized if I'm going to embrace gratitude, I'm going to have to figure out something. But I also started thinking that, first of all, you can't give up. I'm 63 years old. I know I don't look a day over 62. But I mean, you, you just it doesn't matter. You can't give up. And even talking to some of the folks I've already talked to, Larry and Gordon and Bob and a few of the people, just hearing just little snippets of things. You can't give up. There's no plan when it's supposed to work for you, to be a great granddad or a great great granddad or, or whatever it might be. There's no plan, it's whatever happens. I look back at Walt Disney, 300 banks before he got funding for Disneyland, Sylvester Stallone for Rocky, all these different things. So you can't give up. But I had story after story where I wanted to give up before I found gratitude and I thought I've got to pass this on to my boys as well. About six months after Dana passed away, he was in kindergarten. He was four at the time, then now he's preschool, kindergarten, I forget. They do, your son's all screwed up, the gal tells me. So we do this assessment deal, and Connor goes out and waits in the car, and she has me come in, and she says, I want to tell you, what's wrong with your son? He's messed up. He's going to need help the rest of his life. I said, his mother just died six months ago. Yeah, well, yeah, I know, but he's need occupational therapy, this, fine, gross motor. Everything was messed up. So... He's out in the car. I walk back after she tells me, or actually before I walked out rather, I said to him, we lived around Green Lake. And I was a decent athlete. And I said, you know, he's going to be the quarterback at Roosevelt High School someday. She goes, he's not going to be a quarterback. He's not going to do good at anything. And every so often, somebody in the audience goes, did you get her name? <laughs> and I didn't. But I walked out in the car, and I just burst into tears. I couldn't stop crying. And here's Connor. What's wrong, Daddy? I said, it's okay, Connor. But he started playing sports, and I thought maybe they were right. Because first it's coach pitch. For all of you that have children, I'm sure a lot of you do, if not the majority. And then it gets to be t-ball. Now, how do you miss a ball that's on a tee? I just, and he'd swing and he hit the tee. He goes, is that a hit? I go, no, Connor, you have to hit the ball. And then he'd swing over it, and it was heartbreaking to watch this. But he kept trying. We kept going through the different little league progressions. And he tried other sports, but he always wanted to come back to baseball. So we get to May 31st, 2005. And he's playing with his little, little league team. And I'd watch him go back to the dugout so many times and cry. Couldn't hit, couldn't run, couldn't throw, couldn't catch. But he kept trying. So it's the bottom of the seventh inning. It's seven to six, the other team. There's two guys out, and there's guys on second and third. I'm just enjoying the game, and I look, oh my goodness, guess who's coming out of the dugout? It's Connor, he's up to bat. And I am just sitting there just going, please, how, how about a walk? You know, I mean, how, 
how about a hit by a pitch? Just anything. Just, 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 just please don't strike out. And so ball one, ball two, strike two, it gets to be full count. The next pitch comes in. He just rips it down the third baseline. Goes inside the bag. The guy from third comes in to score. The guy from second rounds third. He comes down. Here comes the ball, the catcher. They all come together. The catcher catches it. They all crash down. Ball pops out. And they win the game 8-7. to seven. He is standing alone on second base. And the entire dugout goes out, puts him on their shoulders, carries him off the field. I'll never ever forget. I couldn't talk for a half hour. I had such an incredible lump in my throat. And I thought, you know, when we got home, I sat him down and I said, you know, Connor, it was never about baseball. I'm talking about soccer and some of the things that we're all passionate about. It was about the fact he never gave up. So not only did he go on to play, but he went on to become the starting pitcher on the Bothell High School baseball team. And I was going to try not to bring this up so I don't get choked up, but he left for college yesterday. And I put him on a plane, or actually I got in a plane. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. I was asking Gordon, or telling Gordon and Larry about asking about their kids, and, and um, he's going to uh, Grossmont College for two years in San Diego State. So I got on a plane and came back, and it was one of the tougher things I've ever done, because he and I are very close, and um, especially after Dana passed away and so forth. But one of the things that helps when you've gone through some really tough things, you find out what you're made out of, and you know you can do it again. So one of the things I figured out is that I'm going to have to do something that's going to help. And so this buddy of mine says to me, you need to get a gratitude journal. Now, how many here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Wow, that's, that's a higher number than usual. How many have ever heard of a journal? <laughs> okay, how have ever seen a journal? <laughs> okay, so I got everybody. And so he says to me, you need to get a gratitude journal. He said, that's what's going to help you. And I still didn't know what it was. I went on Amazon, I got one, I just ordered one. And I did what a lot of people do. I just put it on the shelf for a couple of months. I just sat and looked at it. And then I started writing in it finally, and I started noticing these amazing things that happened because you're writing every single day what you're grateful for. And then I decided, well, you know what, I need to have my own. So I made my own, the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. It takes seven and a half minutes a day to write in this. That's it, seven and a half minutes, less than eight minute abs. And it's, it's phenomenal what can happen to you by spending that seven and a half minutes because we live in this world where it's so many, as I call it, deadly, destructive coping mechanisms. I've certainly seen many of them. And you've got to find something that's going to be healthy for you. Now one of the things I say in here, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. Now I'm not going to comment on the average age here today because I'm sure I'm right up there with a handful of you in age. But now everybody's going, do you have an app? Is there an app for the Gratitude Journal? Yeah. And I go, Actually, I'm putting one together, but you can't get it unless you're under 30. That's what I've decided. Because there's something about, there's something about a thought in your brain that goes to your heart, to your arm, to your pen, to the page that reinforces it in your brain. I'm very grateful to be here today. It's a tough day for me. These last two days have been brutal since I dropped off Connor in San Diego. I'm glad I have this talk and I have another one with the, the group later tonight and I have a couple more later in the week. And I'm so thankful for that. But when you start writing every single day what you're grateful for, you will not believe how it'll change your focus on things. And Larry read in my bio, I have 325 videos on YouTube now. And I think over 35 or 36,000 people have seen them. I do a two minute one every single day and I do a featured one on Monday. And yet all the time people come up, how do you keep thinking of new ideas? I go, for gratitude, seriously? Like, did, what happened to Dave Brooke? He's at Starbucks, he's sitting there having a, he ran out. He's just staring at the, at the ceiling. I mean, there, there was one video I did on the furnace. Because it was cold out. And I was, really, I was really grateful for a furnace. So, the roof over your head, all those types of things. And it makes such a big difference. And the way this works, very, very briefly, kind of different, difficult to do when I'm holding a, a mic. But the day, the date, and the daily number. The daily number you put down every single day to describe your attitude and your mood. This is all very personal. You have to show it to anybody when you do this. And one is the worst day of your life. Ten is maybe one of the best days of your life. 
Then you put down any current events or special occasions so you don't need a diary. And then it says, I'm so grateful for it. And you write down whatever. It can be words, sentences, whatever. Generally, one of the top things people put in there is their health. Because without your health, you don't really have a lot. And then the highlight of the day is down on the lower left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side is your gratitude intentions. And that's everything you're going to be grateful for. Because your subconscious mind cannot tell the difference between what you think is going to happen and what actually happens. So it's very powerful. And I could, when I have more time, I do workshops and so on. I get into more detail about all this. But when I was on New Day with Margaret Larson, as Larry mentioned, we had two people up from the audience. And I can't do this because this is just a 20, 25 minute presentation. But I have a little exercise where I hand out just one of the pages. And have people write down everything they're grateful for and what their highlight of their day is. But before I do that, I have them tell me what their number is. So these two that were sitting right here on the set were Nancy and Sue, and they're both eights. And so I thought that was actually pretty good. And so they did the two minute exercise, minute and a half, wrote down, one of them said she was so grateful for her grandchild, and the other one spent some time with her husband doing some wine tasting the night before and so forth. And just a few things in a minute, and I asked them again, and they were both tens. And that's how it can change. And I realized that there's so many easy ways to go down the path of coping but as I said, my experience was it killed so many people I got to know. I thought, I'm going to go out and I'm, this is going to be my mission. And I, I left. I used to manage Nordstrom stores, as Larry said in the bio. I managed Lowe's home improvement stores. And I thought, this is going to be my passion because if you get to impact a life or change a life, it's the most powerful thing that can affect you. And there's so many things about it. I look at when you embrace gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. You can't ever give up. Get a gratitude journal and then share it with other people because the sharing is really what it's all about. So I'm going to wrap up in a few minutes, but before I do that, I would like to give away a book. So I would like to ask you to take out your business card. I always like to give away a book and I will have uh, Mr. Larry grab this little basket if you would. And by the way, I send out a video every Monday at 745. If you'd like to get the video, great. If not, put an X on your card because it's just a minute and a half video. But I will tell you as you're getting that, when you write books, it's such a powerful thing to do and to get those feelings down on paper. But I will also mention that you never want to get too big of a head because I think it was about a month ago. I gave a person a book and I said, I handed it to them and I said, great. And they won it on the drawing. And I looked right at her. She was right about where Gordon was. And I looked right at her and I gave her the book and I said, here you go. I said, if you'd like, I'll sign it. She goes, that's okay. And the other thing that I will say, oh, uh, Tom, uh, Larry's got it. And then while Larry's getting that together, I will just tell you on this book I'm giving away, it's a $25 book called Ready, Aim, Captivate. Talk about not giving up. This has got a bunch of well-known authors in here. Deepak Chopra, Ron Zilica, a bunch of others. And there's yours truly on the cover. I did 27 entries into this until I got the 28th time I got accepted to be in the book. So again, that not giving up is just so powerful. So thank you. I'll grab this one right there. Joanne. Is it Crowen? Cro Where is she? Trying to leave early, huh? <laughs> Must be present to win. Trying to leave early. There you go. Uh, Joanne? Joanne. Yeah. Joanne, if you'd like me to sign it, I'll sign it later for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The main thing that I want to leave people with is this idea of sharing gratitude. You've got to embrace it. And as I said, I, I go into a lot more detail when I have longer talks and, and different workshops. But the question is this. Are you going to have a healthy coping mechanism like a gratitude journal? Or are you going to have one of these destructive, deadly ones that have lost? I've lost so many. And a bunch of them were pills. I was reading on the ferry over this morning about uh, now heroin is becoming a big problem because they're tightening down on the prescription medication. And I even think back to when I was with Dana, when you're the surviving spouse, you feel like such a knucklehead because she went to six or seven different doctors 
Now, why do you have to go to so many different doctors? Well, she was getting pain medication at different places and things. But there's a new phenomenon. I live in Mill Creek, Bothell, North Seattle. And there's a new phenomenon on the east side now where they, the police are called to residence and then burglarized. And they go in and the laptops and the cell phones, everything is, everything's in place. And the medicine cabinets are stripped. And all the medication is gone. So think about it as an alternative. Any group that I speak to, if I get through with one person, it's made my day. And especially after saying goodbye to Connor on Saturday, it is so important to me to make sure people understand these steps and you've got to stick with it and you've got to wait and take as long as it takes. I don't care if I'm this old. I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19, when I was 45 years ago or whatever it is. I don't care. I'm doing it now. And then get a journal, get something, just try it. When I was on the radio the other day, they said, what's your one message? I said, tell people just to try it. Just to try it. When you watch people die all the time, it's ridiculous. It doesn't have to happen. And then once you get that, share gratitude. It makes such a big difference. I've been a pilot for a lot of years. Very, very blessed to get a license when I was in my late 20s. And I was down on ocean shores one day and I was flying along and I was a VFR pilot. I had some IFR training, but I was a VFR pilot by uh, my license. And I got caught between two cloud layers. And all of a sudden there's clouds above me and cloud below, clouds below me and I'm thinking, this is not where you're supposed to be, big fella. Anybody could come out and hit you at any time or whatever. But all of a sudden, the sun came in and hit these clouds. And it was like this kaleidoscope of color above and below me. And I just hang on, I was hanging on to the yoke. My eyes were like this. I went, good Lord. It was like uh, 2001, a space odyssey. It was just unbelievable. And it, and it must have been, I don't know, maybe a minute and a half. It felt like five or six minutes. Anyway, but bam, and I pop out and back out in the blue sky again. And I looked to my right, had a four-seater. I looked to my right and I went, wasn't that the coolest, most incredible, the, the most in, the unbelievable colors, the sights you've ever seen? Oh, I was flying by myself. Nobody ever got to share that with me. And for the, to this day, I can still see those colors, but nobody else got to know. So when you can share something with somebody and it can make such a difference, and even like today, sitting on that ferry, knowing how tough this day is because of Connor and I, again, are so incredibly close. It made such a huge difference to write in that gratitude journal today. And I'm telling you, it can absolutely transform your life. It can change your life. And in my case, it truly, truly saved my life. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I have three things that I'm grateful for. Thank you, Tom.